<laughs> We're back. Yay. Another Sunday night. <clears throat> Whoa. <laughs> put your face in the upright position. This is the captain speaking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it looks like we're up on YouTube, I guess, too. Who's Bing? Yeah, we are up. Okay. Who's what? Well, maybe it was Bing. Oh. <clears throat> okay. Hey, hello, everyone. And welcome to our Sunday night offering of astronomy outreach for uh, December the 4th, the Sunday night astronomy show. Yay! Hey! Hey! <laughs> Yay! We not live on Facebook? Uh, yeah, we're live. Yeah, we're live on Facebook. I'm looking for anybody on YouTube, though. I haven't seen anybody on YouTube show up yet, but that might be a minute or two. Okay. I, I don't see mm -hmm. it here. I'm sure I'm I see six concurrent viewers on YouTube. Okay. And I see us. Uh, here's Renat and Vicky, and I see Vicky. I see Renat. Yeah. There you go. room. Yeah. We even, we even have someone made a statement that's uh, got something to do with what we're talking about tonight. They said, uh, "Has anyone seen the huge ring around the moon tonight?" Ah. ah. Or the rosy. There. There. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, well, my name is Chris Kerwin. I'm the creator and ad admin of the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay. Uh, I'm an amateur astronomer and a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Hey. Uh, first of all, hey! First of all, I'd like to <laughs> introduce our regular uh, co-host and fellow RASP member, Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in beautiful St. John. Hey, Mike! <laughs> Evening. Oh. oh. Yeah, Puffo. And uh, I'd like to introduce our other regular co-host and the fellow RASP member, Mr. Paul Owen from the beautiful uh, dark skies of Moonshadow Observatory in Hampton. <laughs> Drinking a cup of coffee. A suburb of Norton. <laughs> Sub <laughs> suburb of Norton. <laughs> I like uh, it. I'm just down the street from Lower L.A. <laughs> <laughs> Apocalypse, yeah. Lower Apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, so... Uh, on tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. Well, what did Mars say to Saturn? Did you guys like that one? Yes, it was good. Hey, what can did you Mars say to Saturn? Can you give me a ring sometime? Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Badoom, and I even put boom. Yeah. Uh, of course, when we think of the ring planets, uh, beauty of Saturn comes to mind, but there are other worlds in our solar system and beyond where the solar uh, ring systems do exist. Uh, and why is it that rings don't appear as often around rocky worlds? But we're going to talk about that they do might um, our ring systems common elsewhere in the galaxy. In tonight's uh, discussion, we'll take a closer look at ring worlds we know and uh, what we're finding elsewhere in the galaxy. Also this evening, Mike will bring uh, Bino Bud back for another fine binocular target of the week. And he'll have this week's lunar challenge to share as well. Um, Paul will be offering another interesting Rosanna's fun facts segment and an astro tip of the week as well. Yes. Great, good astro tip of the week too. Um, very timely. Uh, I also have another uh, look at what's up this week coming up, including a special celestial event on Thursday because, and it's special because we'll be rained out again. Hopefully, <laughs> it's nothing special. That's that's the man. That's the yeah, that, that that part's not special, I guess. No. Yeah. That's the norm. <laughs> yeah. Um. So anyway, and then I'll have all of your wonderful photo submissions to share as well. So this is a family-friendly, interactive live broadcast. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for those of you joining us from my YouTube channel or Facebook page, we are happy to try and answer all of your astronomy questions here in real time. I don't see any comments yet on YouTube. Um, hoping everything's good out there. Um, anyway, we are happy to try and answer all your our astronomy questions in real time as well. And of course, we'd like to welcome back all of those who have been joining us through the local Rogers TV network. Thank you for your support. Okay, guys, so let's get started then with tonight's program and a look at the ringed worlds of our solar system and beyond. I think we're going to leave it over to Mike, first of all. Uh-oh. Yeah. Just, uh... Uh oh, getting ready. Yes, I wasn't, I wasn't ready. But now <laughs> I'm ready. Share our screens here. Okay. Uh, share. And I think it's this one. And maybe we get right. There so, we go. As the question becomes, where can you find rings in our solar system? So, oops, this one. So, where can you find rings in our solar system? Well, around some of the planets we have, yes, Jupiter has rings, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. 
but there are also three smaller bodies in our solar system that I will say possibly have rings. They, they still have to do some research to make absolutely sure, but they're quite sure that these three smaller bodies have rings as well. So Jupiter, the planet Jupiter uh, has a system of faint planetary rings. The Jovian rings were the third ring system discovered in our solar system after those of Saturn and Uranus. The main ring was discovered in 1979 by the Voyager 1 space probe. And the system was more thoroughly investigated in the 1990s by the Galileo orbiter. So Jupiter has rings. Of course, Saturn has rings. The rings of Saturn are our most uh, extensive ring system of any planet in our solar system. Uh, they consist of countless small particles ranging in size from micrometers to meters uh, that all orbit around Saturn. The ring particles are made up mostly entirely of water ice and trace uh, components of rocky material. There's no consensus quite sure yet as to how or what the mechanism was of formation. Although theoretical models indicate that the rings were likely to have been formed early in the solar system's history, newer data from Cassini suggested that they formed relatively late. So that's an interesting fact. Uranus, even though it's sideways, Uranus has two sets of rings. The inner system of nine rings consists mostly of narrow, dark gray rings. There are two outer rings. The innermost one is reddish, like dusty uh, rings elsewhere in the solar system. And the outer ring is blue, like Saturn's E-ring. So Uranus has rings. And Neptune. The rings of Neptune consist primarily of five principal rings. They're first discovered as arcs by simultaneous observations of a stellar occultation on the 22nd of July, 1984. They were eventually imaged in 1989 by the Voyager 2 spacecraft. At their densest, or at their densest, uh, they are comparable to the less dense portion of Saturn's main ring, such as the C-ring and the Cassini division. But most of Neptune's, or much of Neptune's rings, <laughs> ring system is uh, quite tenuous, faint, and dusty, and more closely resembles the rings of Jupiter. Now, also, at the densest, or at their densest. Uh, uh oh, I hear myself. Oh. <laughs> Somehow I hear myself. Hold on. No, nice. Mini mic. There we go. Uh, 10, 199. Now, let's see if I get this right. Chericlo. <laughs> Chericlo? Chericlo is the largest uh, confirmed small body in the outer solar system. It orbits the sun between Saturn and Uranus, grazing the orbit of Uranus. On 26th of March, 2014, astronomers announced they discovered two rings around Chericlo by observing a stellar occultation, making it the first minor planet known to have rings. And you can see the orbit there going. So it's, it's in our solar system. It's a, like a minor planet, but it does have rings as a rocky planet. And then there's 2060 Chiron. Uh, 2060 Chiron is a small solar system body in the outer solar system orbiting the sun between Saturn and Uranus. After making observations, scientists worked to produce a model of the object, and its rings are proposed to be about 324 kilometers, plus or minus 10 kilometers in radius, and sharply defined. So there's a second rocky body that has a, apparently a set of rings. And then the last one is, uh, how do you pronounce this one? It's Hawaiian. Humea? So in 2017, astronomers discovered a ring around Humea. The ring is about 70 kilometers or 40 miles wide and at its uh, radius of about 200 or 2,287 kilometers from the dwarf planet. The ring is in the same plane as Humea's equator. Particles in the ring are three to one, uh, in a three to one resonance with the dwarf planet's rotation. That is, the ring particles make one revolution for every three times the uh, Humea rotates. So there's the third one that's a rocky uh, planet or a rocky body that has a ring system. And then, of course, my favorite, Pluto. Now, it was always wondered years before the New Horizons probe visited the system, astronomers speculated that Pluto might have a ring system as well. However, after conducting its historic flyby, of the system on July 2015, the New Horizons probe did not find any evidence of a ring system, unfortunately. While the dwarf planet had many satellites aside from its larger, the largest Charon, 
<coughs> excuse me, debris from around the planet has not coalesced into a ring system as theorized. So there you go. That was just an example of what the places have systems or rings within our solar system. Mm, that's cool. Ta-da. So what's interesting too then, because when on that last photo that you showed was something we were talking about before the show here, and that was, what are the ring systems that are within our solar system? Because now there are rings, you know, that we haven't even considered. We weren't, we're only considering rings around certain bodies, whether they be gaseous or rocky. But we've got two ring systems in our solar system, one being the asteroid belt, the other being the, the Kuiper belt. And um, so what is it that those rings are? Because they're, they're obviously... Yes. Yeah. System, and they're obviously orbiting in a uh, in a steady plane. They're you know they're they're doing that. Um, and I was reading something over here on the asteroid belt, which is interesting. And it says uh, the asteroid belt is a ring of debris that exists between Mars and Jupiter. And what caused it to form? And will it ever form a planet? And those are the the things that they're kind of looking at now because with ring systems, as you know, um, you know, they're formed, they're theorized to form in different ways, but a lot of them are basically it's debris uh, that was basically released or crushed and made into the ring system we know today on other planets. So uh, let's say it was a moon, but for some reason it was drawn into the planet's gravitational pull and then and then it basically just crushes and breaks into pieces and that's exactly how i shouldn't say exactly that's what they theorize that the ring systems are made from so when you look at the the kuiper belt and you look at the asteroid belt uh one being frozen rocky stuff uh, in the kuiper belt and the other being actual asteroids um <laughs> rocks and whatnot that aren't frozen well i suppose it depends on the temperature out there but um so there's a couple of ring systems right there that, uh, that are in our solar system. And we're assuming in a lot of the other solar systems that are out there. Mm. It's almost like the sun has a ring system. <laughs> maybe you could carry that all the way out to uh, the yeah. Earth cloud. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, uh, what's that, a light year out or whatever? Yeah, Oort cloud. So that's... There that make you go, hmm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah, not. I, um, and I know that they're talking about uh, like um, some of them, like Saturn with eighty-two moons. Uh, one of the moons in Celebus, I know, is one of the ones that we're you know we're pretty excited about getting out to take a look at because if there's any place that there may be life on on a world in our solar system, one of the places that they're looking at is in Celebus because it's an icy world with a, maybe a, a giant ocean underneath, a global-sized ocean underneath, uh, like Europa of Jupiter. But uh, Enceladus actually spits geysers out uh, into space, and Cassini threw, flew through the geysers, Cassini spacecraft, and it tasted them, basically, and it was water, right? Yeah. But they also know that uh, Saturn's rings are disappearing uh, slowly as well, and Enceladus, one of its jobs is actually replacing, replenishing the ring system by the geysers that are leaving uh, its, uh, its surface. It, those those geysers are crystallizing and they're replenishing part of the ring system. So the ring system was going to be disappearing quicker if they hadn't if, if Enceladus hadn't been where it where it is kind of thing. So it was kind of neat. So the other thing um, too that was neat about the ring systems that, that I, I, and I'm again theorized of course is if you look at something like the Cassini division or any kind of thing that separates the rings as they go out, they're assuming what those were, were a larger formation that went in there and disturbed the space uh, in, the, in, the, in the line of a ring. So it's like if, almost like you had a moon that would be pushing through in the rotational thing, keeping its area clear of, um, of debris, and then somehow that moon dissipating uh, over time. And, and they're assuming that it, it was one of those larger bodies within the ring systems that were forming that actually cleared those pathways in between yeah. the rings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. amazing. Yeah, and then, you know, when I was reading an article about there's two different kind of theories on how rings are formed. 
One of them is, did they form while the planet was forming and it was debris that was left over that kind of fell into place but didn't coalesce into a moon or something like that. Mm -hmm. Another one was maybe it was moons that were orbiting that were in the same orbit and actually collided, broke up, and then didn't recoalesce into uh, you know a moon again, but scattered out into a uh, like a debris ring system. So it's, it's, it's amazing how they you know can figure this stuff out. <laughs> one of the one of the theories they're talking about, like why they're mostly around larger bodies, was that when a moon gets so close to a planet that it can break apart, mm. it's because that planet is huge, right? Um, and its its gravity extends out farther into space. Ooh, there's my light. <laughs> extends out farther into space, whereas if it had been, say, a moon uh, uh, encircling the Earth or Pluto or something like that, by the time that moon is, gets affected so much by gravity that it's going to be taken apart or crumbled apart, it's actually coming into the atmosphere of that planet. It's, it's in too close, so yeah. um, it, would, it would more likely collide with the planet than it would be broken up around it, so. Yeah, um, <clears throat> one other theory, too, about that, I'm just thinking about that, that um, the asteroid belt and it's okay. Is it a ring system or is it going to be another planet over in a period of time? Mm. Yeah. It, well, it coalesce. Yeah. If it did, then it would be another planet in our solar system. So is that what's happened with the dwarf planets that are in the asteroid belt right now? Could they have been? Yeah. Like there's so many yeah. things that are, you know, that uh, being it's theory and we'll never see it in our lifetime, but yeah. But was, you know how were things formed, and how you know so which uh, which way are they going? Are they breaking apart and being rings, or are they actually coming together and forming another planet? Right. That's neat. Yeah, it's just anyway interesting thoughts. Um, I'm going to share a little video here if I can, just on something that I found. Um, oh, hang on, I'm going to stop the volume. Yeah, because it's not just um, happening here. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, so I was going to share uh, a quick uh, video of uh, something I found out there on a on a uh, planet called J one four seven zero one four zero seven B, and uh, it's uh, four hundred light years away, and uh, it has a huge ring system. I'm going to let the guy uh, in this little video talk about it. So just make sure I can see it, guys. Let me know. Yeah, there it is. Okay. okay, so we should get some sound. I'll make sure to get some sound here. Yes? Yep. Sound there? Okay, here we go. Saturn is the only planet in the solar system that is known to have an extensive ring system. The rings of Saturn extend up to 282,000 kilometers from the planet. But, these beautiful rings made of rock and dust now have some competition. Situated 460 light years away from Earth, planet J1407b orbits a young star like Sun called J1407. This giant planet is more than 10 times the size of Jupiter and is the real Lord of the Rings. J1407b has 37 rings with a total radius of 89 million kilometers. To put that in perspective, the distance from the Earth to the Sun is only about 148 million kilometers. Since the planet is 460 light years away from Earth, traveling there with current technology would be impossible. Even if you traveled at the speed of light, it would take you 460 years to visit the planet. But imagine, what would it actually feel like to watch the Lord of the Rings up close with your own eyes? The planet's ring system is so wide that if Saturn's rings were replaced with the rings around J1407b, they'd be easily visible at night and appear several times larger than the full moon. If you're a fan of Saturn and its beautiful ring system, traveling to planet J1407b would be a dream come true. Even if it wasn't possible to walk on the surface of the planet, considering it's a gas giant, Seeing a planet with a ring system 200 times larger than Saturn's rings would be fascinating. Astronomers believe that J1407b is a planet, although, given its mass, it might even be a brown dwarf. 
The rings around J1407b might not remain so huge for a long time. These tiny dust and rock particles would gradually merge together and possibly form beautiful moons around the planet. J1407b is a very young planet. In fact, it's 16 million years old. For comparison, Saturn is more than 4.5 billion years old. Who knows, even Jupiter and Saturn might have had such gigantic rings around them when they were younger, which today exist in the form of moons around these gas giants. Yeah. Oh, kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. Yeah. It's a big yes. one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, ring system twenty times the size of uh, what we're uh, we're used to seeing with Saturn. Seeing something that big in the sky, uh, I might just share one more picture here. That would be awesome to be able to look at, photograph, and <laughs> yeah. Uh, one second here, I can get that right photo up. Uh, let's move it up to here. Oh. oh, just bear with me. Here, I think I can get it there. Close that one. And share my screen. This guy. There's what it should look like, I guess. Oh. Wow. Yeah, so compared to the moon. Uh, yeah, what a view that would give you at nighttime, right? Oh, if man. it was around Saturn, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't yeah. be, might not be that bright, but it would be certainly huge to see. <clears throat> we need bigger binoculars. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, kind of fascinating topic. Yeah. Um. And yeah, and they talk about uh, ring systems that might actually go back into forming moons again. So maybe moons got too close, they collided together, produced the ring systems, and then eventually, uh, instead of them dissipating out into space, they would actually reform into moons. So maybe that's where some of the moons came from with with uh, 82 moons of Saturn and 79 of Jupiter, you know. And of course, the rings are being kept in place by shepherd moons. In the case of Saturn, there's a couple of moons that ride one on the inside of the ring system one on the outside and they just kind of roll along with with the with the rings one pushes in on the rings and one pushes out in the rings and they kind of keep them in pattern as they're going around shepherd moons they call them pretty neat little name well i think we covered ring systems yeah i think we've been around uh, somebody had a question out there that we can't answer yeah <laughs> no i i haven't i haven't yet seen a question on youtube i don't know whether you guys can log into one of you guys could log into youtube and put a comment up but um, not sure if people are commenting. If they are commenting on YouTube, I apologize. I haven't been able to see any comments yet. Just ring us them. if you have a question. Pardon me? Just ring us if you have a question. Ring us if you there have you a go. question. We're not, we're not <laughs> putting out a good one. Is it, when, is it, when is it a ring and when is it not? <laughs> right. No. Yep. If you marry it, yeah, put a ring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's move on then to... Uh, to our next discussion, it's going to be uh, Bino Bud talk. Bino Bud. Bino Bud. Got a ring planet there first look at in Binos? Well, you might be surprised. Then again, you might not. <laughs> 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 All righty. Uh, it's already been that time. So binocular target of the week this week by Bino Bud is the Christmas tree cluster. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Your favorite. Our favorite show is coming. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> oh, the Christmas tree cluster was named for its triangular shape formed by a cluster of very young stars. It looks like a tree in visible light. The Christmas tree cluster and Cone Nebula are both discovered by William Herschel. He discovered a uh, cluster in 1784 and the nebula in 1785. The NGC 2264 is a large, bright cluster easily visible in binoculars, excuse me. It consists of about 80 stars from eighth magnitude and spans about half a degree. Where do I find it in the sky? Well, if you went out tonight at 11 o'clock and it was clear uh, and spun your body around to 120 degrees east southeast and looked up, you'll see Orion and you look across and it's right in here. So uh, how would you do that? Is this the twins? No, it's not. Anyway, just come up off uh, Beetlejuice 
and head, well, you can look down here towards the Rosetta Nebula and then go straight up. How's that? <laughs> and you will find it, trust me. The Christmas tree will stand out. Again, here's a closer shot. Come off of Beetlejuice, get across to the Rosetta and you'll spot the Rosetta and then come straight up and you will find the Christmas tree cluster. So this is what it looks like. Not really in a pair of binoculars, but a nice shot anyway with the dark lanes. And it kind of looks like the branches on a Christmas tree and the stars are the lights or bulbs on it. So that's where you get the look. In 10 by 50 binoculars, look at this. It's kind of upside down, but guess what? It does look like a tree, a Christmas tree with the branches sticking out and the balls for uh, the stars for balls. So that looks pretty cool. Compared to the full moon, easily probably three full moons in size. So it's a very easy target to look at, not hard to find. And when we get there, Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, Artemis 3 gets there, that's what you're going to see. <laughs> that's binocular target yeah. of the week by Bino Bud. <laughs> I don't know how typical that's going to be. You know what I want to do? I want, to see, I, want to send, I want them to send a flat earther on Artemis mission, the first Artemis mission. Just send one up so they can be the representative of all the other flat earthers and say, here's what it looks like. A plate. <laughs> yeah. We won't get into that. No, okay, we won't go there. Let's forget it. <clears throat> kind of a cool idea, though. Anyway, you know, I got in trouble when I was in physics, and the teacher said pi r square, and I said no, 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 pi r round, pi r round. square. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, that's one of those. That's one of those jokes, Mike, that we tell at like four o'clock in the morning after we've been up all night observing the sky to the star party. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really funny then. <laughs> anyway. okay. Family friendly yeah, show right. and all. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Astro tip of the week, sir. Paul's got a great one here called uh, Planetary Photography for, for Beginners. Yes. All right. So um, I'm just going to talk briefly. I'm just going to actually show a page that um, that's one of the retailers in the United States put together. And it's called, um, let me see if I can find the page here first before I share it, that might help. So it's called Planetary Imaging for Beginners. And the reason I even bring this up this week is um, this week and uh, leading up to Christmas, you get people saying, I want to get into astrophotography. What should I do? I, you know, I want to do, and, and, and like anybody else into anything that they're excited about, they just want to jump in with both feet until both feet get, surrounded by cement you can't get out because you get so much into it and then you get frustrated and so on and so forth so rather than going through all those things uh and trying to get into deep sp space or deep sky astrophotography which is something that's quite to be honest is quite difficult until you get your workflow down uh planetary imaging is one of the easiest ways to start and uh it is for a number of reasons and one of the main reasons that it is is because when you're getting into deep sky astrophotography, you have to do what they call guiding, which means that you have to set up a whole other telescope on top of your telescope or in the back end or wherever you are, whether you're guiding off axis or you're guiding on top of your scope. And you have to have an equatorial mount, which means that now you have to know how to polar align. You have to know how to do a specific balancing. You got to run all this other software just to make sure that you stay locked on a specific star because with deep, scape, deep space astrophotography, each image that you take, and there can be up to virtually hundreds of them in one run, and which could take you 30 hours to capture. Um, if, if you get a bunch of those uh, stars that aren't nice and round and perfect, then you gotta start throwing away a whole bunch of subs. And so you, you know, but with, with planetary imaging, it's the actual opposite because with planetary imaging, uh, what you're shooting, whether it be the Jupiter, Saturn, moon, sun, they're all very, very bright. So therefore, um, because they're so bright, you're imaging, um, your exposure time on a, on a, on your sensor is so short that you can virtually take hundreds of pictures within a couple of seconds. So uh, because of that, you don't have to worry about tracking on your telescope. So you don't have to worry about guide scopes and guiding and, and taking 30 hours. You can get 
2,000 images in a, in a matter of a couple of minutes. So it's really, really, really simple that way. It's less frustrating and more rewarding immediately uh, than trying to do the deep sky stuff. So that's where kind of what I wanted to put out there before I showed you this, uh, this uh, particular site that I'm going to recommend anybody who is either doing um, planetary imaging now and are struggling a bit with some stuff or haven't started yet, but want to, want to know how to, how to get into it. So I'm going to share a page that I think would be a very good uh, place to go for this. So let me just share my screen. And let me know when you see this. Can you see that now? Yeah, yeah it's up. Okay, so this is a company called OPT. Uh, and they're in the United States, a good bunch of folks there. Uh, they're they're, they're uh, astrophotographers themselves. They sell gear and they do they host some shows and they do all kinds of cool things. So this is something they put together and it's called uh, Planetary Imaging for Beginners with the gear guide, which is even better because at the end, they'll give you a bunch of stuff. I'm not gonna go through everything. I'll just sort of scan over to give you an idea of what's in here. So in the table of contents is what is planetary imaging? So everything from what it is to what is what is seeing, how important is seeing when you're taking photos, what's lucky imaging, um, stacking, processing, all of the things that you need to know. And it starts off with basic things. What so tells you what planetary imaging is, um, what is uh, astronomical seeing. And this is extremely important. You know, on these, um, uh, they have little videos for all of this that you can actually see the difference between good seeing and poor seeing. For example, this, if you look at this gray blob, I'm not gonna play the video, but that's kind of what you might see on a night that the seeing is just awful. And on a night of excellent seeing, look at the difference. Look at, you know, this is just pictures still. This isn't even video running. And you can see so much more clarity. So they, they cover those basic things so that you're not wasting your time on a crappy night. And they'll tell you how to know, you know, what is a good night and what's not a bad night. They talk about lucky imaging. All that simply means is you're taking thousands of images and then you're taking a percentage of those images because a percentage of those thousands of images are gonna be good. And that's the ones that you're gonna to throw together and stack up. Um, how to frame the planets, the sun and the moon. They talk a little bit about that. Uh, talk about the stacking process, which just simply means taking all those images, putting them all together. So you have one main image to start to play with and sharpen and, and develop. And then you get into the in equipment that you're going to need. And they talk a lot about this. And uh, the one thing that, um, that you definitely will need is a, is a powerful telescope. And even then, they're recommending certainly that you have a Barlow. Unless you're shooting the moon and the sun, then it would be the opposite, of course. Only because they're so much larger. <laughs> and what kind, you know, so what's the best mount for planetary imaging? They talk about German equatorial being the most ideal, but not necessary. You can do this type of imaging just with an alt as mount. And then they talk about which camera is best for doing this type of imaging. And they're talking about these little planetary cameras like these ones. And because the sensor is so small, you're filling more of that sensor with the planet. Uh, and this is why these cameras are so much faster is because the resolution is so much smaller than these larger cameras. Then they talk about what's the accessories you're gonna need. And then they talk and they should give you examples of rigs. And then they even get into how do I photograph the sun safely? And they'll talk all about that. So I'll go back up to the top of the page. So for those who wanna see what this is, uh, basically it's from OPT. And if you just type in um, optcorp.com, uh, um, this should come up because this is part of, their, part of their regime. So that's basically it. So planetary imaging is quite simple to get started. If you're not familiar with what we just talked about, um, you know, don't worry about it because as you go through it, it'll come quite clear to you quite quickly. And so this is something that I would recommend for anybody getting in any type of astrophotography, go here first, because you'll get a lot of the basic things you're going to need to know anyway. So that's the uh, astrophotography tip of the week. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Paul. Just trying to uh, delete some spam here that's coming up on YouTube. Oh. All kinds, but sorry, folks. Uh, 
for that. I'm now I'm not able to see your comments on my desktop, but I am catching them on my cell phone, and I'm trying to delete them as they come in. So okay. it's been happening a lot lately. Uh, anyway, we'll carry on. But thank yeah. you, Paul, for that. Yes. Carry yeah. on. If you were normal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. They got no place, nothing else to do. I guess. No. Uh, okay, we'll go with a uh, with uh, what's up talking maybe now, if that's okay. Uh, oh, you. What's up, Doc? Maybe me, yeah. What's up, Doc? Hey, Mike, let's send him some spam. <laughs> 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 Easy. <laughs> okay, spam in a cam? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't eat that stuff. No. What was it called? <laughs> spam in a cam. Cam? Cam? Is that what it was called? Canned ham? Uh, yeah, it was like that in square cans, and it had the little key on the bottom. Yeah. Remember that? <laughs> okay, which one have we got here? We got the proper screen or the... Uh, you see, uh, what's next up? slide. <laughs> oh, you see next slide there? Okay, next let's slide, change my... Uh, next slide, Phil. Play settings. Uh, <laughs> so presenter view. There, how's that one? There we go. Okay. Get your planetary cameras out and get a picture uh, of that now because... <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, let's let's talk about what's going on this week. Uh, we'll start out with uh, uh, Tuesday night. The moon greets the Pleiades star cluster. Now, the Pleiades is that nice little cluster up there that kind of looks like a little dipper. Uh, check it out in binoculars. It looks really pretty. Uh, on Tuesday evening, our waxing gibbous moon greets the beautiful Pleiades star cluster in Taurus. Uh, the Pleiades, also known as the Seven Sisters, Messier 45, and um, other names by different cultures. There's an asterism which means it's not a constellation. It looks like something that is something that we would kind of familiarize ourselves with. Uh, and it's an open star cluster c containing middle-aged hot B-type stars in the constellation of Taurus. Now, at a distance of about 444 light years, it's among the nearest star cluster to Earth and simply stunning in small telescopes or binoculars. Hey, guys? It is amazing. Yeah, Paul, great to capture that too. Um, yeah, it's really uh, like you've got a lot of stuff happening up in that part of the sky right now. You've got Mars sitting there. You've got, you know, the nice waxing moon. You've got Aldebaran. You compare the colors between Mars and Aldebaran. Pleiade star cluster. You've got Betelgeuse and the Orion Nebula, of course. So lots of lots of nice stuff to take a look at. Yeah. Um, on Wednesday, okay, number of things happening here Wednesday to Thursday. So I'm going to kind of lead into them because it leads into what's going on uh, Wednesday at midnight into Thursday morning. So Wednesday evening, first of all, look to the northeast at 4.47 p.m. Uh, for the moonrise. Our moon uh, rise, that's about the same time as sunset, I think. <laughs> or 4.42, I think sunset is. So it's yeah. uh, really getting uh, close to our shortest day of the year, I'll say, daylight. Our moon rises closer to full, uh, closest to full on Wednesday evening, the full cold moon. Now, other names include the long night moon, uh, the oak moon, the wolf moon, the moon before Yule, uh, the, fro the frost exploding trees moon <laughs> and, the Mi'kma, yeah. <laughs> and the Mi'kmaq chief moon. Uh, the moon actually turns full on Thursday morning at 12.08 a.m. Atlantic time during the lunar occultation of Mars. So that's an important part to remember right there, that it actually turns full while it's occulting Mars. Uh, Wednesday evening again, of course, the moon greets Mars. Uh, the moon and Mars rise together on Wednesday evening, and early in the evening, they will appear less than a half a degree apart for most of us, which is the width of the full moon. Now, later that evening is when the special celestial event occurs, the occultation of Mars. we will talk a little bit about that one. Now, also, um, on Thursday, uh, no, we're going to talk about Thursday now. Mars is actually at opposition on Thursday. Mars is at opposition. This is when our sun uh, Earth and Mars are, we should I should say, lined up. <laughs> uh, this means that Mars rises uh, when our sun sets and sets when the sun rises. So Mars is available for viewing all night. Unlike the other planets, so it takes us about 15 months to catch up to Mars each time. So um, it's, no, I'm sorry, 25 months to catch up to Mars each time. That's more like it. Um, so we're catching up to it uh, on December the 8th. So Mars is at opposition. The moon is full, and the moon is occulting Mars at the same time. So the Mars actually turns at opposition just about an hour after the occultation takes place. So we'll get into Wednesday now. Here we go. The lunar occultation of Mars. Very rare celestial event on the way. The lunar occultation of Mars. Now, 
Uh, what is lunar occultation? That's when the moon occults or passes in front of another celestial object. Could be a star, planet. Um, as far as for it being a rare event next week, here are some of the factors. So we, we did have a lunar occultation of Mars just a few years ago, back in 2020, I guess. But um, the, uh, Mars was not at opposition at that time. So the moon will occult Mars at 12.02 Atlantic time on Thursday morning. While Mars is still occulted, our moon actually turns full at exactly 12.08 a.m. Atlantic time. And all this happens on the exact day within 90 minutes, in fact, of the planet Mars being at opposition when the Sun, Earth, and Mars are in a straight line as viewed from above. So the moon turns full while occulting Mars on the day it reaches opposition. Of course, the moon uh, is at opposition as well at that time because it's full at the same time. And for all this to happen at once, our moon has to be full at the time of the event. Uh, the last time the moon occulted Mars, we had a waning moon. It wasn't quite full. Uh, Mars has to be at opposition, which doesn't happen every year. The last time it was uh, in February of 2020. And since our moon travels in an orbit that takes it either five degrees above or below the plane of the Earth as we orbit the sun, the ecliptic, um, the moon will also have to be uh, on the right day of its orbit to occult Mars. So it has to be in exactly the right position. So um, how rare is that? I haven't really run the calculations, but I doubt that it would happen again in our lifetime. I've heard a few statements that it's probably once, at least once uh, at the minimum, once every hundred years, but maybe even longer than that, to have the two, especially with Mars, uh, specifically because Mars and us, we go around the sun at not the same rate, but we can't catch up to Mars every year. So. Um, perhaps the rare part is that we'll actually have a clear sky to witness it. <laughs> so <laughs> the current current forecast is not favorable for our location. Looks like rain. Uh, but if it does improve, you can expect that I will be offering a live feed of the event on my YouTube channel and hopefully on Facebook as well. If I can't offer it, I'm going to be looking around for somebody who is offering it and I'll try to uh, re-offer their feed. So uh, tune in around 1130 or so Wednesday night. And we'll see what we can come up with. So fingers crossed for this one. And uh, go move into Saturday now. Io in a shadow transit Jupiter. Uh, so on Saturday evening, we get another opportunity to watch Jupiter's moons in action as the Galilean moon Io and its uh, shadow transit across the face of Jupiter. Well, the event begins with Io transiting from 1748 to 1924, a couple of hours there. Uh, Io's shadow begins its transit at 1908 and ends at 2119. So a couple hours of that as well. So. Nice. I've seen some nice photos. People have, have uh, imaged uh, this this particular uh, event uh, happening a number of times now throughout the last month or so. Uh, we've had a couple of double transits as well. Um, so it's really nice to see that little black dot sitting there on Jupiter if you're looking at it through the IP the telescope. And uh, as always, I'd like to refer back to uh, our regular watcher here, Lisa. Lisa Fanning with Lisa's Lookup, Astronomy and More. Uh, that's where she, her Facebook page is located. Her She's also on Instagram, Mastodon, and uh, Twitter as well. I'm going to check out that Mastodon, see what that's about. But uh, Lisa puts out this chart every month. Uh, this is our December chart. So she lists uh, the events that are happening, the times, uh, the dates of the events, the times when they are best viewed, and also uh, what you require to view it with, either naked eye, binoculars, or a telescope. So check her out at Ruby Moonbeams on Instagram, Twitter, and Mastodon, and Facebook. And we also have our regular November, December chart uh, put out by Kurt Nason. Uh, Kurt does a great job on this. He lists all the events that are happening throughout the month of November, December here. Uh, this takes us up to about the mid-December, so I expect a new one will be coming out very soon. Um, we're going to get to the Geminids uh, meteor shower coming up. We'll talk about that too next week, the 13th, 14th. But uh, all of the events uh, here that we talk about, the, all these little blue ones here are the... Uh, transits of the moons of Jupiter passing around uh, Jupiter, either eclipsed by Jupiter's shadow or passing across the planet, whatever. So he does make a great uh, list of those. And he's got the red spot as well. If you've never seen the red spot on Jupiter through a telescope, there are many dates here that are picked out for that as well. So uh, this this is, uh, we use this through uh, St. John Astronomy Club, sjastronomy.ca, and also through RaskNB. So that's what's up. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, going to need an umbrella for the big event. What's up, pal? Oh, well, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> what's up? Yeah, yeah, what's up? Okay.
Um, okay, we got the WhatsApp covered. Let's go with a lunar challenge. I'll with that next. All righty. Share my screen here. I think there's the right one. That's the Uno. Here we go. We up there? Awesome. We are. So it's actually you know, a binocular moon challenge, uh, moon crater challenge, but this time it's going to change from a crater to something different because it's the last one I got to offer you. And it's not quite a crater, but you'll get what it is here in a minute. Last week we had Ezekiel, and there is Ezekiel right there with a nice spike coming up in the center. Mm. It should be visible even tonight uh, with binoculars. And the next challenge is the Apennine Mountain Range. Now, if you can't find this, you need bigger binoculars. <laughs> the Apennine Mountain Range is formed uh, when the rib... Uh, yeah, uh, here. Pronounce that, Chris. <laughs> Where? Mara Ribium. Imbr Imbrium Basin. Mar 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 yeah. Imbrium, yeah. <laughs> Was blasted out nearly 4 billion years ago. Mountain range on Earth take millions of years to form... Uh, the magnificent ranges that surround Mir Ibrium were created in a matter of minutes, believe it or not. Mm. Uh, they resulted from the shock waves that exploded out in the original uh, Imbrium uh, impact. The uh, Apennines stretch out over 370 miles and include 3,000 peaks. That'd be a whole lot of uh, Everests. The highest mm. peak <laughs> in the range of uh, Mons Huygens. Uh, which organs, stretches, yeah. yeah, which stretches from its base to its top an incredible 18,000 feet. Uh, the most famous were the Apollo 15's mission uh, landed very close to it. Uh, the landing was considered one of the most uh, was a scientifically successful missions of the Apollo program that started at last, uh, was it the 3J series missions that included the lunar rover and a stay of actually three days. Apollo 15 explored smaller peak Mons Headley Delta and Rima Headley not or Rill, excuse me there, Paul, you and your Rills. <laughs> this really? was perhaps the most geologically <laughs> diverse landing uh, <laughs> site of the whole program. Mm. But anyway, there's the Apennine Mountain Range, ladies uh, and gentlemen. I challenge you to get your binoculars, go out and take a peek or a picture of that. It is incredible. It is, yeah. It is. I wish I could get a shot like that. <laughs> you know what? When you look through a, a really good telescope, like your nine and a quarter, you can actually see that. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. It comes oh, yeah. up beautiful. And There's no question about that. Beautiful. And that, that's just uh, a jaw dropping. <laughs> no yeah. question. I had a nice capture of a live feed the other night there, and it was yeah, just, just like that. Beautiful. And that uh, Aristosthenes at the end there, too, that nice big crater. That, that never gets boring to look at that. <clears throat> no. Okay, so that's Mike's last lunar challenge. So that means that I'm going to take all of the entries that we had from the last number of weeks that Mike has presented the lunar challenge. And uh, where is it? Oh, here. No, it's here somewhere. Somewhere. Over the ring. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so uh, if you enter your image of that, draw it. I don't care what you do. Uh, send me in the, where the photo is. <laughs> or send me in that area of the sky that that, that Mike just talked about. Uh, what? Well, draw it. That's just a mountain range. Dude. How long? How hard is that to draw? A circle. You can draw a mountain range. <laughs> a, bunch, oh, a bunch of humps. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep it light, Paul. Gee. <laughs> I want anyway, to anyway. 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 Scale. <laughs> anyway. It's like you're talking to a kid. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just whatever. Just scribble it on a piece of paper and send it. <laughs> um, anyway, I'll take uh, I'll take entries uh, for that right up until next uh, next Friday evening. We'll say Friday evening. <laughs> Are you done? <laughs> uh, this one's going on the blooper reel. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Anyway, yeah, uh, just just grab a photo, whatever. Get you know, take one off the internet, whatever. Send it in to me. Show point out point out the Apennine Mountain Range, and send it in, and we're gonna put it in the draw, and you get a chance to win this book. <laughs> Fifty things to see in the moon, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll send it directly to your door. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to call it a night? <laughs> uh, uh, this okay. Is what happens at star parties. This is what yes. happens at star parties. Yeah, yes. after too many too many cookies. <laughs> well, you can't have too many cookies. Yeah, cookies. <laughs> okay, so that's what we'll be doing. Um, so uh, 
again, grab a photo of the Apennine Mountains, uh, point to the Apennine Mountains in the picture, send it in. We'll uh, we'll add it to the collection. And anyway, I just want to get the contest up. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness! Look, I gotta I gotta mute these two guys here or take the cameras off. All right. <laughs> uh, okay. What's next? Oh, I don't know. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I, I think we got Rosanna next. <laughs> Let's put him in the spot. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's so funny. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> <laughs> my screen here. And now this is this week's. <laughs> Rosanna's. Fun fact. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Welcome back, Rosanna. I hope you're having a good time laughing at us like we are. <laughs> so much fun tonight. <laughs> anyway, Rosanna, let's get back to your story. So Rosanna writes, hi, Paul. November has passed, and it really was a rather pleasant month considering how gray and dreary November can sometimes be. In relation to all things space, November was just so full of wonderful events and pictures. I've gathered some of the highlights. <clears throat> so this is NASA's Artemis 1 Orion spacecraft, which blasted off November the 16th, has broken Apollo 13's record. The uncrewed capsule has now traveled farther from Earth than any other human-related spacecraft, exceeding Apollo 13's previous record, by about 32,000 kilometers, <clears throat> excuse me, or 20,000 miles. Orion is now on its way back to Earth, where it is expected to splash down on December the 11th. Artemis 1 Orion lunar flyby, NASA's Artemis Orion spacecraft flies past the moon in this image captured by a camera at the tip of one of the spacecraft's solar arrays on November the 21st this year. Orion launched atop the Space Launch System on November the 16th and used the lunar flyby to enter a distant retrograde orbit, or a DRO, around the moon. The dark ring area on the moon's surface is the Mar uh, Oriental Impact Basin. So that would be that spot, I think, right there. And it could be here. I'm not sure which one that is. Um, I'll look it up. So <clears throat> this one, this startling eyeball in space is captured by uh, Phoebe's partial solar eclipse by NASA's Perseverance rover. NASA's Perseverance rover used its left mast cam, Z, camera to capture this image of the Martian moon Phobos crossing the sun on November the 18th, 2022. Isn't cool. that a cool photograph? That's cool, yeah. Let me, let me just uh, increase the look of that so you can see that. Wow. No, that moon is not round. It's just like a big asteroid. Uh, but look at that. That, uh, yeah. that, uh, that's an incredible shot. What do you call mm. that? A transit. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I suppose if it was bigger, it'd be an eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, wild. So you can feel uh, free. Oh, uh, you can feel the immensity, the immensity of Jupiter in this next one. So Juno spies Io and Callisto, NASA's Juno spacecraft spied two of Jupiter's moons, Io, which is the top one, and Callisto on the bottom as it flew past, past the planet uh, in November, 2021. NASA released this uh, citizen process version of the image in November, 2022. Isn't that quite a shot? Wow, yeah. So there, the detail uh, this uh, spacecraft is getting is incredible. Like oh, Juno is just made, taking some amazing images. Unbelievable. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> so that blue ray seeming to be zipped behind the astronaut, Frank Rubio, is actually a space sunset. So NASA astronaut and Expedition 68 flight engineer Frank Rubio is pictured during a spacewalk tethered to the International Space Station's starboard truss structure. Behind Rubio, the last day, Ray, sorry, of the orbitable, 
orbital sunset penetrate Earth's thin atmosphere as the space station flew 418 kilometers or 258 miles above the African nation of Algeria. So that's what you're seeing is the Earth behind them as it's going mm. through sunset phase. That's what it looks like up there. That's amazing. Crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this one, which reminds me a bit of, uh, Kadinsky, uh, of a Kadinsky painting, if you zoom in on the black triangle, you might be surprised to discover it is a shadow, a shadow that is only seen from space during the late autumn and winter months when the sun is lower in the northern hemisphere sky. France's monastery Mont Saint Michel's walls and spires cast a perfect shadow onto the bay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this image was captured by the European Union's Copernicus Sentinel-2 satellite on November the 12th, 2022. And so I'm going to zoom in on that. Isn't that something? That, eh? So it's kind of like looking at the Apennine Mountain. This yeah. green, purplish thing would be the mountain, and that would be the shadow cast right behind it. That's wow. crazy. Isn't that wild? So here actually is that building. Yeah, I guess you can only walk out to that during low tide. And if you get stuck out there, you're out there until it changes. <laughs> well, that'd be okay. I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> I could stay there for a few low tides. That's amazing. That's and incredible. And a provoking fact, the International Space Station has been continuously inhabited since November the 2nd, 2000. So about 25% of the world's current population was born after 2000. That means a quarter of the humans on Earth have never known a time when there weren't also humans up there. Wow. That? Oh. Now that's a fact. Hmm. So it's being touted as the best birthday party of 2039. Some of the guests even left orbit to come. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that is this week's. Rosanna's fun fact. Yay. Yay. What a great fun fact. And that's this, awesome. Yeah, that is just that's just unbelievable, that whole thing. But seeing from being in space and then looking down and seeing those shadows is so similar to what Mike was showing with the Apennines, how that is, you know, depending on it's all perspective, right? Mm. Yeah, I see them when you when you see them up there going. I mean, going around the Earth every ninety minutes, and they're outside working on the platform or whatever, and they're in the dark, you know, and they get lights lit. And then, yeah. you know, fifteen minutes later, it's all lit up. <laughs> back in the dark, <laughs> back all lit up. <laughs> Just wow, eighteen what if sunrises. Solar sunsets. lights. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably a good idea. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Rosanna. Once yeah. again, Fantastic. great topic. Okay, let's get to photos then, and then we're going to close out. So um, let me get uh, those up and running. Let's put this over here. It always takes me a minute to get the photos. I can only open up so many windows, and then things start to... <laughs> da, 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 da. Time. <laughs> yeah. It's funny when this guy calls up, tries to con this old lady on a... About her computer, she says, well, the, the first thing I need you to do is open your window. She goes, just a minute. She comes back and she says, okay. He says, now I need you to log in where? Into the windows. My, well, but I was just there. <laughs> I went over and opened my window. Ah. Uh, very la fenetra, fair me la port. very la fenetra, fair me la port. Very laughing at Very many of these. Uh, nice spot. <laughs> I'm going to try to share. I'll share very many laughing at you. Very laughing at There you go. Uh, okay, I'm going to get a right spot All there. Right. There we go. I think. Oh, beautiful. Yep. Nice. Either sunrise or something. No, you guys are in the way. Hang on. <laughs> oh, maybe I can get it. No, we're not. There's an arrow there. Okay, there is an arrow there. Yeah, there is. Okay, the let's go back. Okay. All <laughs> right, uh, let's go with uh, Eve St. Germain. First of all, he said, here's my submission for the contest. Of course, we got the moon contest going on right now. Yeah. Shoot the moon contest. Um, 
It's just a few I grabbed from the Sunday Night Astronomy Show address. Uh, this was taken at Middle Island in Miramichi with a Nikon ZFC with a 16 to 35 millimeter 3.5 to 6.5 DX. I had to underexpose to get the moon, he says. And uh, meanwhile, a weasel was peeking out to see what I was doing right there. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. one for cool. the weasel awesome. yeah nice nice shot though oh look at the reflection awesome. yeah yeah right in the yeah cool eh? right in the water nice thanks Eves. okay uh let's go from there then to uh mr brad perry hang on not that one this one Brad says, uh, hi, Chris. He says, here's is my submission for the contest and also for the show. This was taken at Middle Island in Miramichi with a Nikon Z. No, I'm sorry. I got the wrong one here. Hang on. Oh, look at them all mixed up. Just a second. That doesn't happen often. <laughs> here we go. Okay. Hey, hi, Chris. He says, just sharing a couple photos from this week. One is of Orion, Taurus, Pleiades, and Mars taken on Wednesday. Wow. Cool. Come on. Yeah. Get them all. Uh, nothing too exciting, he says. Just welcoming in the winter constellations. I think it's pretty exciting. Oh, me too. Um, well done. And his other photo here is of the crescent moon over downtown Fredericton, taken uh, Saturday. That's, That's last week. Tough. Wow. Uh, nice yeah. shot. Awesome. Was praying for a Santa Claus pray to end in time to get a shot of that moon before it's set, and they got it just in the nick of time. So yes, good you stuff. Did. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Beautiful. Crazy. Fantastic. Great stuff, Brad. Okay, we're going to go from there to uh, Kathy Adams. <clears throat> Her image oh, of, yeah. a, of a moon this week. <clears throat> Look what stands out in the top of that picture. <laughs> What's that? Right there? What's that, that stuff? Cur that yeah. curved line of bumps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure does. Stands right out at that face. Easy. Um, and uh, here's there a lunar straight wall, <clears throat> which was uh, also visible just a couple of nights ago. Where's the snowman? Hmm? The snowman. Oh, they're uh, they're down here. Drunk Perfect. snowman. That's yeah. a Perfect snowman. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the lunar straight wall is a is a hundred and ten kilometer long fault line on the moon. So it's actually just a gentle slope of about three kilometers wide. Uh, but the way that the light hits it from this angle, it looks like it's a very steep cliff. So they call it the straight wall. Now, if you get it from the other side, when the sun is lighting the other part of it you don't see it at all but just a trick of light and shadows on the moon yeah nice shots nice mm. and here's her mars capture yep. yes sir nicely done oh. mars nice and bright now I, I see a few people on here commenting about how bright mars is right now in yeah. our evening sky and it's coming up to opposition this week but um very bright for sure right now brighter yeah brighter than i've seen it in a long time Minus 1.6, I think, is its magnitude. Yeah. Not quite as bright as Venus or not quite as bright as Jupiter, but certainly in competition with Jupiter. Um, Kathy's, uh, again, with a couple of moons there with Jupiter. Beautiful. Yeah. Nicely done. And we got these from Chris Benoit. Chris says, uh, last night's fun with stars. He said, an astronomic H-alpha filter, Canon 450D, myself modified. Uh for my first ever, again, uh, shot of the Eastern Veil, which we're going to bring up here in a second. There it is. There we go. Oh, yes. <clears throat> West. Sign, Chris. Oh, sorry. A bit of detail in there. Yeah. 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 Well, he's got the veil, plus he's got a big portion of the Pickering's Triangle. Yeah. Up here. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Very nice. And his Orion Nebula. Oh, oh that never gets old. Nicely done. Yeah. It's that time of year, eh? Got to love yeah, it. it. Yeah. Good job, Chris. Okay, I'm um, going to move from there, I think, to David Hoskins, I think, is next. Yes, David Hoskins. Look at these now. Okay. Wow. Yeah, he's getting uh, like that. That's uh, There's Plato right there, and beautiful real right here. Nice big wow. valley here. Yeah, so, love that spot. Love that area. <laughs> it these gets better and better every time. Yeah. I captured these close-ups of the lunar landscape last night while waiting for Mars to climb high enough in the sky for imaging, he said. Details were C8 SET, uh, an ASI 298. Uh, mm with an ir pass filter an eq 6r mount now best 500 frames stacked with as3 wavelets with registacks levels and noise reduction with photoshop and final tweaks with ms photo well done incredible beautiful love all this like little detail like little shadows and stuff and oh yeah but, but you know what when you shoot stuff like that you can just sit there and then grab a lunar map 
and then mm. you start seeing, you know, what what exactly am I looking at there? It's right. How big are they? And yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, we have all these little uh, wavy lines here, even on the surface of the moon. Eh? Mm -hmm. Um, another nice shot here. Wow. The South Pole area. Look at craters inside of craters and cuts. Like, like, uh, John Dobson said, you know, almost everything on the moon is a crater or it was yeah. at one time because it's got craters inside of craters. And you can tell that these are the, you know, the younger ones. And the, well, that's the one that's a test to your uh, telescope site. See, they get progressively smaller as it goes in the curve. Right. Yes. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> Nicely done. Look yeah. at all kinds. Everybody loves the South Pole like that. And here's another great shot of what are these? Oh, my God. <gasps> Look at that. I think you knew what I was going to do my talk on there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, look at the detail there. So Very now nice. we're talking. The tide must be out. <laughs> must be out, yeah. There's yeah, big Aristosthenes the there at the end. And, uh, of course, the area of Apollo 15 up there at the top right yeah, where they landed. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Love it. Great detail. Love the shots of the moon. Thanks, David. And uh, here's this, a capture of Mars as well. Awesome. Very Nicely done. Yep. Lots of detail coming out. just rotated or if there's a storm coming. Yeah, right here. Oh, orange yeah. up top. But, yeah. uh, you can see the caps. Yeah. So. But up in here, yeah. Um, okay, we're going to go there to Lisa's uh, capture of the moon and Jupiter this week, three degrees apart. Uh, awesome. That was earlier, yep. Nice. And uh, that was a nice capture this week. The moon is actually approaching uh, Mars now. It'll be up to by the Pleiades here shortly. And then Mars, it's nice because the moon does travel across that uh, that ecliptic path and uh, gets to visit a lot of the planets throughout the month and, and different article or different uh, celestial objects. So nice, Lisa. Thank you. And uh, I end up with this one with Robert Gadet's image. He said, this picture's... <laughs> This, is picture, this speaks volumes, he said, and it's been quite a ride for the last three years. And uh, so here's his, uh, here's his captures of the images he's captured over time. That's awesome. Yeah, I like that. Great tree. So yep. we got, let's, well let's, see, let's see if we can All name. Right. Okay, so I'd say that I didn't get his notes, but I think that might, uh, was that serious maybe? Okay, that's can't, be serious. <laughs> can't be serious. Get the Pleiades. There's, there's a Pleiades. There's a M57. Yeah. And he's got uh, triangulum, triangulum there, or 101, okay? That's 101. Just okay, kidding. what do we go? What do we got right here? There's Orion. Uh, Ryan. Ryan, yeah. yeah. That and will be here we got. Or something close to it, maybe not quite the M33. Well, that's a Triffid, is it? That's Triffid there. Right. Yep. And North American sorry, Nebula. Uh, North, American North American Nebula. Nebula. Something there. Well, move down to the comet, yeah. Which, uh, yep. That's uh, Neo Eyes, right? Yeah. La Lune. La Lune. And yeah, and what else we got there? That's uh, Running Man. Or... Running Man, yeah. Uh, M51, maybe. Yeah. M51. Yeah. And that's uh, M17. Yeah, that's the uh, yeah. the lagoon. Yeah. Um, Saturn, Saturn, Jupiter, lagoon, and, uh, and uh, lunar eclipse. Eclipse. Jupiter. And, yeah. Uh, wow. A lot in there. Yeah. The <laughs> There's Apple dumbbell. Corner. The dumbbell, and uh, yeah. Wow. Well done, Robert. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, that's very yeah. cool. That's a that's, that's, a, that's awesome. a great Christmas card. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. Okay, um, that's probably I think about it. And uh, if you have some, oh, I'm gonna go back to the first have we are. Okay. Uh, if you have some images, send to us. You can send them into <coughs> Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. We love getting them here, and we love showing them off. So, what I get to say about that? Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. For those great, great images. Um, okay, I'm going to get to our closing comments, I think. Maybe. You think? Uh, yeah, I think we are. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're, guess, we're pretty close. Yeah, let's, let's go with it anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so on next week's episode, we're going to be offering something. It's a brand new segment. Um, now, our local veteran astronomer and longtime RAS member, Kurt Nason, will be joining us. Uh, for his constellation of the month Yay. Uh, talk. Yay! I think it's time we start doing something like that. It's a great topic. Uh, Kurt will be back every month uh, to provide his insights on some uh, favorite timely constellations. Now, this one next week is going to be Orion, so we're going to get Kurt's take on Orion, um, and that's starting with next week's program. 
So uh, we'll welcome Kurt next week. And also, uh, Stefan Picard is going to join us from Cliff Valley Astronomy because we're going to be making the draws for our wonderful prizes that he's donated for our current contest. Yay! Yay. Just in time for Christmas. So uh, we still have time. Uh, you still have time to enter. I'm still accepting entries until midnight on December the 15th. Uh, so the contest, again, if you uh, had a party by Cliff Valley Astronomy, which is one of the prizes he's given away, uh, what would you see in a telescope? Is it... Uh, you know, Jupiter, the moon, Saturn, aliens, UFOs, doesn't matter. <laughs> Draw a picture and send it in and or have a have a parent take a photo of it. That's the best way and send it into astronomybythebay at gmail.com. We have two telescopes, at least uh, for the under 12 group and a private star party for up to 12 people with a telescope. And then the other part of the contest is the shoot the moon contest where I'm asking for a photo of the moon. Don't worry about the quality. They've never been judged. They never will be judged. It's just the fact that you get out, capture the moon, and send it in. Um, send it in the same address, astronomybythebay at gmail.com. That's where I'm accepting all the all the entries. Um, take a photo of the planet along with it. Like some people send in uh, images of the moon and Jupiter together. Well, that's two entries right there. Share the contest for your third entry. All those will go together. I'm going to bring them all out, uh, hopefully, in a nice little collage uh, uh, next week. And then we'll we'll make our draw. And after that show, we're going to take a two-week break. Uh, of course, the following week is uh, Sunday, which is Christmas Day. And uh, the following week after that is New Year's Day. So we're going to spend some time with family and friends, uh, all of us here. And we're going to take a little bit of a break until the new year. So we'll be back to, with you again on the 8th of January. So and then closing tonight, we want to thank you once again for your continued efforts uh, or continued support of our efforts here. Sorry. A special thanks once again to Rosanna, of course, for her continued contributions to our program. Thank you, Rosanna. Always great to have uh, those amazing uh, articles you dig up. I don't know where she gets all the information, but it's amazing. Uh, we also hope that all of you would join us from Rogers and enjoy the program tonight. Now, if you would like more information about the wonders of the night sky, you can uh, find me at astronomybythebay.ca. You can find, and I can find these guys from there. So, uh, also a special thanks to, to all of you who share our program. We really do appreciate it. And remember, we do love getting your photos. So send them into Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. And we'll be happy to include them on our next broadcast. Uh, if you have a suggestion for a topic for a future show, we always like to get those uh, suggestions in. Uh, please let your friends and family know that, um, that we'd like those send in the same address and let them know as well that we'll be back here next Sunday night at 8 p.m. on YouTube and Facebook to edutain you on astronomy and the wonders of the night sky. So for now then, from Mike and Paul and I, uh, we wish you a safe week, everybody. Lots of clear skies, maybe Wednesday night. Let's hope we get a little sucker hole, maybe. That'd be enough. And as we like to say, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes. Point it up. Good night, everyone. And there it is. <laughs>